Hey, Unlock listeners. This episode is part of our special Divergent Thinking series. They're interviews with experts in seemingly unrelated sectors that are designed to spark unexpected connections in your brain. They're designed to push your vacation rental business forward. This episode is brought to you by VRMB Communities, changing the industry through collaboration. Listen later in the episode to learn more. Louis Rosenberg is a technologist, inventor, entrepreneur, writer, and currently the CEO and chief scientist of Unanimous AI, which is an artificial intelligence company. Today, we're going to talk about swarm intelligence, how a fragmented group of individual businesses like vacation rentals can amplify our intelligence by thinking together in systems. Dr. Lewis Rosenberg, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. Should I, should I call you doctor or Lewis? Uh, you can just call me Lewis. You are sounding great, despite the fact that your son stole your microphone, right? Is he off at college now? He is he is off at college. Uh, both my kids are uh, are off at college. Although it's uh, all college is remote learning, so it's a definitely a unusual world, especially for my daughter, who it's her freshman year and uh, her first experience of college is is remote. <laughs> even though she's she's living there, uh, it's very very strange world. <laughs> Wait, does that mean that she is actually living on campus or in a home somewhere near the school? She's living in an apartment near the school with uh, with a few friends just to f- at least feel like she's a college student. <laughs> but um right, but they are taking classes remotely, which um which is interesting and in some sense relevant to uh to what we're going to talk about today because um my my whole interest is how you connect groups of people together who are all in disparate locations and enable them to uh, not just to work together well, but to actually think together well. My, uh, my mother is a professor at Johns Hopkins, and she teaches cognitive science. I'm very excited to share with her probably the first episode of my podcast that she will ever find interesting. <laughs> and she has been adapting to this new remote teaching uh, environment better than a lot of her colleagues who she say have trouble uh, adjusting technologically. So definitely a new world for all of us. Lewis, you have an extremely boring resume. You have founded one of the earliest virtual reality companies. You've worked with NASA. You've written books. You've done short films. You have what seems like roughly one gazillion patents. I would like to know what is the common denominator about all these career moves. What makes what what kind of work do you seek? That's a great question, and there actually is a, a through line to all that, which is that um, my my interest is really the the intersection between uh, people and technology, um, and really the intersection between how how we can use technology to make to to, to Amplify and enhance human performance, and so uh, going back, you know, now uh, almost 30 years ago, when I was uh, a, a PhD student, um, my interest was in virtual reality and, and augmented reality, and uh, and and then I worked at NASA and the U.S. Air Force because I was interested in how those technologies, uh, particularly virtual reality and and augmented reality, could be used to amplify human performance. And, and then I founded a, a company after I, I finished my degree that really focused on how can we, how can we use those new technologies to train people to, uh, to perform surgery without actually um, having to practice on people, which uh, turns out that's how, <laughs> that's how doctors do it. Uh, there, uh, there was a, there's a saying in, in medical school, uh, see one do one, which, uh, which is really not that comforting for patients uh, if that's how people are learning. And so even back then, um, 25 years ago, we were working on virtual reality to, to allow doctors to train on procedures in a, in a safe and interesting environment. And then I 
I was working on augmented reality, how to introduce uh, uh, sights and sounds into people's environments to enhance their performance. And, and that was really uh, fascinating and interesting to me. Uh, but then over the years, I started to realize, well it's, well, it's really interesting to look at how technology can amplify and enhance the performance of an individual. It becomes even more interesting when you start looking at groups of people and how can technology be used to, uh, to connect and amplify the, the intelligence of groups? How can you make group, allow groups to make better forecasts and predictions and decisions and, and harness their insights in, um, in new and powerful ways? And, th and that's what I've been doing uh, uh, for the last uh, six or seven years. Uh, Five years ago, we founded uh, this company, Unanimous AI, which focuses on that. It's an AI company that's focused on amplifying the intelligence of human groups. And do you get the feeling that with this pandemic sort of mixing everything up and changing all of the terms that it, even things like um, quarantining and social distancing, do you feel like this is your moment? We're entering this new chapter in which it, it, it all boils down to our ability to collaborate virtually? Uh, it's definitely, there's definitely a rapid acceleration in, uh, in a change that was, was happening anyway and, and um, would have happened anyway, which is this idea that people want to be connected in, in really deep ways from their locations. And you know we we tend to think about the this big change in society with the invention of social media, where we where you know the, the claim being that it it brought everybody together in in deep ways. Uh, really, social media I, I think makes a lot of people feel isolated. Oh, thank you so much for saying that. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and, and and it makes sense because what what and it divides what it 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 divides people up. Um, it. It splits groups up, um, but but worst of all, what it really does is instead of connecting people into groups, it really just allows people to pass messages back and forth. It it is not a replacement for real collaboration, real um, real forming of crowds or groups. It allows people to pass messages back and forth, and allows them to you know to to upvote it or or give it a thumbs up or give it give it a star. And, and it turns out those methods of, um, of amplifying a signal within a group are actually the opposite of, of what you would do to create intelligence from a group. And, and I say that because what, what happens in, uh, in current ways that the groups collaborate, whether it's on uh, social media or on a platform like Reddit, or even on something like Amazon, where where you know people give stars to products or to, to books, uh, those methods actually uh, are really bad at finding the the intelligence in a group. And, and in fact, uh, there's, there's been some studies that have shown that if you post something on a platform like Reddit, and you and you give the first uh, the very first uh, response an upvote, then the next person is 30% more likely to, to upvote it. And, and if you go a million times, you know, after a million people have, have upvoted, the final result is still 30 times more likely to be an upvote than a downvote. And so it's, and that's just, that's basically called noise, right? That's random noise that gets amplified. Same thing on Amazon. If somebody gives something up five stars, the next person's more likely to give it five stars. And so you have so what so the current methods of social media and um, and and polling online actually amplify noise, whereas what we really want to do is amplify the signal. What we really want to do is find the intelligence of groups, and uh, and amplify that. And and that's really uh, what we do at Unanimous AI, and have have focused on that uh, for a while. And and it works. We can we can take groups of people anywhere in the world, connect them together in a very unique way. And uh, and amplify their intelligence uh, by by very significant amounts, allowing them to make more accurate forecasts or decisions, or uh, if they're a team and they need to make priorities, prioritize uh, uh, a set of tasks, they can do that in a in a, in a way that much that that uh, is a much better representation of the of the feelings of a group, and um, and it's because we are connecting people in a different way 
not the way social media does, not the way polling does, but actually the way that biological systems do, that, that nature does. We didn't just make this up out of thin air. We went back and looked at, well, nature has been trying to solve this problem for hundreds of millions of years. Um, maybe we, we have something we can learn from the natural, natural world. We, we, I often hear from our vacation rental colleagues who say, I don't know why, but our Facebook group has just become so um, loud and negative. And it's actually because the algorithm rewards that kind of inflammatory behavior. And it's not making people more intelligent. It's probably doing exactly the opposite. Let's, let's move into this swarm intelligent and where it does originate in nature with a little story that I would like to share for you this morning. Uh, I've just moved to Miami. I go out with a swim group each morning in the open ocean. It's the most amazing way to start my day. And I was swimming this morning, preparing mentally for, for our conversation. And I passed through the most gigantic school of little bait fish. <laughs> that was, there had to be millions of them. And uh, they were swimming right at me. I felt like almost like I was in an Avatar movie <laughs> or something. And they're turning as a group with one another. And it was just a remarkable thing. And I was like, man, this is swarm intelligence. And of course, right at that very moment, I got stung by a, a jellyfish <laughs> on the arm and I had to get out of the water. So that interrupted my swarm intelligence uh, thinking for this morning. Where does this phrase swarm intelligence come from? What are its origins in nature and how is it applied to us humans when we're not getting stuck? It comes from this basic problem of what happens if you have a, a large population uh, and that population could be a, a school of fish or it could be a group of uh, a flock of birds uh, or it could be a swarm of bees. Um, but you have a large population and each of the individuals in that population has a slightly different view of the world. Um, it, they have slightly different experiences. They have slightly different, um, actually slightly different personalities. They, they have something to contribute to the, to the decisions of the group. Um, so how do you harness all those different views and opinions and allow a group to make good decisions? And, and in the School of Fish, it, it's, uh, you can think about, um, let's say there's thousands of these fish uh, they each have slightly different views of their environment as they're moving through the ocean. They are functioning together essentially as a superorganism. They are navigating their world, mm -hmm. moving around through the ocean, doing all the things that, that they need to do to survive by harnessing the intelligence of that group. There's, there's no fish in that group who's the leader. There's, there's, none of them are leading the way. Um, they, they are making, uh, they, they are becoming a superorganism they are essentially forming a hive mind and, um, and making decisions that are really good for their survival. Uh, same thing with, with swarms of bees. Um, in, in a swarm of bees, there could be a swarm of bees, there could be 10,000 bees. And, and I can give you an example of, of some amazing ways they make decisions. But same thing, um, they make decisions as a group. and and. You know, bees and is where the word swarm comes from. So swarm intelligence was inspired by how uh, how colonies of bees make decisions because they were the first colonies to be studied by scientists. But now the, the scientific phrase swarm intelligence refers to everything from uh, swarms of bees to schools of fish to flocks of birds, which do the same thing. And so you can ask this question, well, well how do these groups make life and death decisions uh, by harnessing the different perspectives of all of the individual members of the group, uh, well, they don't do it the way humans do it. They don't take votes or uh, or <laughs> surveys. Uh, they don't do polling. There's no survey monkey in in nature. Um, <laughs> what what they do is they form systems, real time systems, uh, with feedback loops, so the groups actually push and pull on each other to converge in real time on decisions. And each of these different organisms does it in a slightly different way. Uh, schools of fish, uh, they actually uh, detect little vibrations in the water between, between fish as a way to, um, to basically communicate their intent, the, the direction that, that they think the, swarm, the, the school should go. Uh, bees do it in, in, a, in a similar way, but, but 
uh, scientists actually uh, call their method a waggle dance because um, when, mm -hmm. when sci scientists started studying bees, they would see all these bees were dancing. And, uh, and so they call this thing a waggle dance. And it turns out that these dances that a bees do to make decisions as a, as a swarm, um, it's not a dance, they're actually generating vibrations. They're generating signals um, that they basically combine in this multi-directional tug of war to push and pull and to reach a group decision that will allow the bees to, to make life or death decisions for the colony that are optimal. And, and in fact, scientists have found that uh, when bees have to make uh, very, very difficult decisions, they will reach the optimal decision 80% um, of the time uh, by, by forming this swarm intelligence. And that's not because they are very intelligent individual little bees, right? right. And that's, that's the amazing thing is that, you know, bees obviously are, are tiny. They're, um, their brains are, each of their brains has less than a million neurons in it, which... Um, which sounds like a lot, but compared to a human, uh, a human has 80 billion neurons in, in our brain. <laughs> so, so uh, you can you can take the size of our brain, divide it by 80,000, and that's that's a bee. Um, they 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 cannot, as individuals, make complex uh, analysis and decisions. And yet, uh, when scientists study the behaviors of the group. The group itself can make remarkably accurate and sophisticated decisions, um, and uh, and that's swarm intelligence. And so the the question that really got me interested um, was, well, if birds and bees and fish can get so much smarter to, by thinking together in systems, why can't people do it? And um, and well, we we didn't evolve to do it. But can we create technology to make that happen? And and really, that's what that's what we do at Unanimous AI. We we built a, a software platform called Swarm, that enables groups of people from around the world to uh, to log in and to answer questions together. And um, and you know we we humans can't waggle dance like bees. Hey, some of us can. <laughs> Maybe. And so we created a really uh, a unique and easy and fun interface where uh, when people log into Swarm, they use their mouse to control what looks like a little magnet to pull on the group. And um, and so there's this glass puck that floats on the screen, and you control a little magnet. And there could be hundreds of other people around the world controlling their own little magnets and and people are pushing and pulling together as a system while our AI algorithms are watching everybody's behaviors and finding the optimal path uh, for, uh, for reaching a decision. And, and in this way, we've, we've shown that we can bring groups of people together. They could be small groups, uh, three or four or five people, or they could be big groups, you know, 300, 400 people. Um, but in, in all cases, what we find is that when they work together as a swarm, to make decisions or predictions or forecasts, they uh, they become significantly smarter than they would be if they were trying to do those same things as individuals. So I'd like to dive into both how a system differs from traditional polls and surveys and votes and stuff like that, as well as this idea of a feedback loop, because I think that's really resonates with a lot of our colleagues. But before I, we go into that, um, you you made some headlines with your predictions of the Kentucky Derby, right? Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that we do uh, we do a lot at Unanimous AI is is take on challenges from journalists because we you know we make this bold claim that we can take a group of people and make them smarter, and um, and then journalists will say, okay, well if you know predict this, and so we predict lots of things from. Uh, from sporting ab events to the Oscars to elections, and and one of the predictions that we were you know famous for being challenged to do was the Kentucky Derby. And so what, um, and this was from CBS Interactive. Uh, they said, okay, um, why don't you you know harness the intelligence of a group of people and predict the Kentucky Derby, and uh, and we're interested in not just a prediction of the winner. We're interested in, in you telling us who do you think will come in first, second, third, and fourth, and um, <laughs> and in, in horse racing that's um, that's called the superfecta, uh, and it's uh, it, you know gamblers will often bet on the superfecta because it's the in, in some sense the the hardest bet in in sport in all of sports. Right. And and the particular year that we uh, we were challenged to do that 
the, the superfecta odds were 540 to 1. And so, and so I should say that we at Unanimous AI, we don't know anything about horse racing. We didn't have data about horse racing. Uh, what we did have was the ability to amplify the intelligence of groups. And so we, we found 20 horse racing enthusiasts. And so not experts, not professionals, just enthusiasts who, um, who follow the sport. And we had them log into the Swarm platform from, uh, from you know, their computers you know, are scattered around the country. And, uh, and then as a swarm, we asked them to predict who's going to come in first, second, third, fourth. And then we gave those predictions uh, to the reporter who, uh, who wrote, a story about, wrote a story about it, which put some pressure on us. And then she actually went to the Kentucky Derby and placed a bet on the Superfecta and tweeted out her ticket, which put even more pressure <laughs> on us. And then the, uh, the story became uh, pretty famous because our prediction was perfect. And, and anybody who had placed a $20 bet um, on those four horses uh, would have won $10,000. And and so uh, I placed a $20 bet and won $10,000. Uh, the re- nice. the reporter placed a bet. A bunch of her readers placed bets. One of her readers um, actually reported winning $40,000, which... Um, which is pretty amazing. And so, so it's a fun story, but the, the part that's to me the most interesting that reporters usually you know, don't focus on is if you go back and you look at those 20 people who participated in the swarm, uh, as individuals, not a single one of them got, got all four horses correct. And in fact, had they just taken a vote, uh, they would have gotten one horse right out of four. But when they worked together as a swarm, they were perfect, and and that's the power of swarm intelligence. It's, it it will outperform the individuals in the vast majority of cases. It will outperform just taking a traditional vote uh, in in uh, the vast majority of cases because we are um, we're not just asking people for uh, you know give us a, a single piece of data. We're actually having people act and interact, pushing and pulling on each other, and the and the algorithms are watching their behaviors to see, you know, who is you know which which people are have high conviction, which people have low conviction, and it's finding the path of of uh, of this puck as it lands upon an answer that is really um, a much better combination of their knowledge and wisdom and insight and intuition, and um, and it, it makes groups of people smarter. So I've been in, um, had a lovely conversation with the president of Unanimous, David. Thank you for that introduction, uh-huh. by the way. Um, and he helped me understand how the company can conduct a swarm session, which is a facilitated uh, problem-solving experience. Can you just explain, um, maybe for those who are not using this swarm session by Unanimous, uh, how does a system, this kind of dynamic problem solving, differ from a poll or a vote? Right. So it's man, that's a great question. And and let me give you an an example that is really, really simple and kind of fun. Let's say you had a group of people and it was five people, um, and you needed to make a really, you know, a life or death decision, which is where should we go for dinner? Right. Um, and that's, you know, that's a pretty common decision. It's, it's, um, it is, uh, easy for us to think, well, the best way to make the f- a fair decision is just take a vote. And so you have five people and one person votes for Italian food and one person votes for Mexican food and one person votes for Chinese food. One person votes for Thai. And let's say two people vote for Indian food. So you, so you have these. And so now you say, well, let's, we took a vote, and the most votes were for Indian food, and so let's. But it was only two. Yeah. And, and it was two, but you, you, all the other votes were split, and you say, well, we'll, well, we got two votes for Indian food, only one for the others. The fair thing to do is to go to Indian food, um, and and that seems like a good way to tap the intelligence of the group or to find the kind of the optimal decision. But it turns out we have no reason to believe that the group uh, will optimize their satisfaction by going to Indian food. Uh, you, we can go to Indian food and, and the other three people who, who voted, maybe they hate Indian food. Yeah, like I might be allergic. Right, you might be allergic or maybe, or maybe, you, went, maybe you went there for lunch, right? right. And so um, it gives you an answer, but it, it's not necessarily the optimal answer. Now let's say instead we did this as a swarm. 
So as a swarm, it's a it's a real time system where everybody's everybody's connected together over the internet. Um, you might you on the screen you'll have this little glass puck. You'll see these different options uh, around the puck uh, that would say Italian food, Indian food, Thai food, Mexican food, uh, and then uh, and then it this the the session starts and and during the session and and this is fast this it, it, this will happen in under sixty seconds so it's very very fast but you instead of just wow. clicking a vote you'll you'll use your magnet and you'll start pulling this puck towards Italian food and someone else starts pulling mm -hmm. the puck towards Mexican food and someone else starts pulling the puck towards Thai food and then two people are pulling the puck towards Indian food and so because there are more people pulling for Indian food this this puck starts floating towards Indian food. But it's a system. So everybody immediately reacts. As soon as it starts moving towards Indian food, somebody who is pulling for Chinese food says, you know, I wanted Chinese food, but I just I just can't go to Indian food. And to be honest, I'm just as happy with Italian food. So they switch to Italian food. And somebody else who is pulling for Thai food uh, might think, yeah, you know, I had Indian food for lunch and it's going to Indian food. So I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, resist it going to Indian food and I don't care. And <laughs> and so everybody's adapting. And so the puck starts moving to Indian food and then stops and starts moving another direction. And it will find the path to the solution that the group can best agree upon. And if it wasn't five people, but it was a hundred people and they were trying to decide on, you know, the most important product features of a new product that's going to be launched or the most important marketing messages uh, for a new advertising campaign, well, now what you have is you have you know 100 people who are working together and are converging upon the best combination of their knowledge and wisdom and insight and intuition to uh, to give you know to make the most of their group intelligence on these important issues. These and so for businesses, whether they're trying to make a sales forecast or trying to find the best uh, the best set of product features, or um, or trying to, to prioritize a, a set of tasks that that are important, um, they can converge very quickly. And again, each question that we ask gets gets answered in less than sixty seconds. Um, they can they can reach you know they could they can make a better use of their combined insights. Now I should say that each question can an gets answered in under sixty seconds. Very often, you know, a group will come together. Uh, in, as a swarm for you know 20 minutes because they're going to answer a whole bunch of questions right they you know they'll come together and they might have uh, a whole set of priorities or a whole set of forecasts they're going to do and so um, it's usually um, you know it, it'll usually be for a um, you know 15 20 minutes but all they need to 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 use swarm is just a web browser on any computer. Uh, they can use it on a tablet. They can use it on their phone, um, but it is real time, and that's really you know the one constraint that's very different than a poll. I can send a poll out, and people can answer the poll anytime. A swarm, because it's a system, is real time. So we you know if we were going to do a swarm to decide on um, you know the best marketing message for you know vacation rentals, we and we had 50 people who wanted to participate, we would send out an email invite. Just like if you were inviting somebody to, you know, to any meeting uh, using you know, Google or whatever, and they would click on the invite and it would invite them into the swarm at the same time. So they would all participate at the same time right. because they are interacting with each other. They are amplifying each other's intelligence. What makes a good question for use of this kind of intelligence versus what's a bad kind of question? Yeah. So... Um, the way we like to think of it is that if a question is really easy, meaning if I, you know, if if I have a, a group of people and they're all, you know, 95% of them are going to say give the same answer, well, just take a poll because you're going to, you know, you're going to get the same answer with the poll. It's it's not a controversial it's not a controversial question, it's not a difficult question. 90% of the people are going to say this, so um it's not challenging. It's it's too easy for uh, a swarm. Um, on the other side, if a question is too hard, and by too hard I mean people are just guessing. So I'm going to ask people to forecast. Um, I could take if I took a group of 
the future of vacation, what, what the future of vacation rentals looks like, for instance? Well, if, um, if it's a question where you have a group of people who have real insights and you want to know what, mm-hmm. you know, how can I amplify their, their insights, then that's a, actually a really good question. If, um, if I took a group of people who are experts on vacation rentals and I asked them to, uh, to come together in a swarm and diagnose some x-rays from, uh, they would have no idea what they're looking like, right? And they're just guessing. And so if you're just guessing, then it doesn't matter if you do a, a poll or a swarm or so. If you're just guessing, you're, you're, you're not going to amplify intelligence. So, um, okay. so what, the way I, we look at it is we're amplifying the intelligence of a group. We want a question that's, that's hard enough that, that you want to amplify the intelligence of the group because, because it's a challenging question. But you will also want a question that um, that actually leverages the intellig- the the experience or the knowledge or the intuition of that group. And so, if you have a group of people who are knowledgeable about vacation rentals, great. You can amplify their intuition. You can amplify their knowledge, their experience, their wisdom, and ask them questions about that. You can also bring together customers. And and that's the other thing that's interesting is that. Mm-hmm. Um, when we, you know, we work with lots of uh, lots of businesses, lots of Fortune 500 companies, and they really use Swarm in two different ways. They either amplify the intelligence of their of their team, their sales team, their marketing team, their engineering team, or they amplify the intelligence of their customers. And um, and since uh, since you are in Florida, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. One of our customers is the Miami Heat, uh, the basketball team, <laughs> and. We did a project for them where they wanted to optimize their um, optimize the the features of the their season hick season ticket holder benefits, right? So when somebody's a season ticket holder, they get a set of benefits. They wanted to find out well, what's the you know what's really the best combination of benefits that will get people to buy season tickets. And so what we did. Uh, was they, they had groups of their customers come into Swarm and um, and prioritize and rank the importance of these different features um, to help them, you know, optimize their product, which in, you know, in their case was season tickets. But again, you could do the exact same thing for vacation rentals, right? Uh, you could do the exact. We we have uh, customers who are you know, big soft drink companies. Uh, like some of the largest soft soft drink companies in the world, and they um, they've looked at you know different marketing messages, different um, t- even things like you know different different designs and colors, and how how they can optimize the response there. Um, we've we've had uh, customers who are uh, large banks, and they look at how to optimize the different features of uh, of commercial loans. And so everything from you know, from season tickets to soft drinks to commercial loans to to vacation rentals, you can uh, you can get a lot of benefit out of either amplifying the intelligence of professionals if you have a large community of professionals who have knowledge and wisdom and insight, or amplify the intelligence of your customers, and um, or do both. And very often it's interesting to mm-hmm. do both and actually see. If your intuition as professionals is aligned with the the intuition of your customers, this episode is brought to you by VRMB Communities, a collaborative tool that's fundamentally reimagining the way our industry works from the ground up. We built VRMB Communities when we realized that in order to best work together, vacation rental independents need to convene in one virtual place a safe place. If you're a community leader interested in being part of our alpha testing phase, please reach out to learn more. Now let's get back to the show. I want to move a little bit more into how this line of thinking can be um, used with some of these deep challenges that we're working on in our industry. Uh, But I did want to check off one item on my list and you've used the word feedback loop a couple times. Is this really simply what the bees are doing with one another when they're trying to determine the best place and safest place for a colony? Is that the same approximate mechanism that small business owners should be doing in asking for feedback and then re 
calibrating their opinion? So when, when we talk about feedback loop, again, we're talking about it in, in real time, meaning let's say I have 50 people and we're evaluating, let's just say a marketing message for some campaign. We all are going to have an initial opinion, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I, but my opinion in ice, if I just took a, a poll, my opinion is, is taken in isolation. For example, if you took a survey of, you know, 50 professionals in your space and they all filled out the survey and, uh, and then you looked at it, you tabulated it up and then you sent them back, uh, the answer, you said, oh, here's what we decided. Most of those people would feel like, yeah, they dropped their survey into a black box and the answer came back that was different than they said. And they feel like, you know what? Nobody cared what I thought <laughs> because, because it came back different, right? right? Because there is no, there was no feedback loop. Whereas in a swarm, you would have 50 people and, um, and they're pulling in different directions. And, and maybe I start pulling for something and I see, oh, there's a large group of people pulling for this other option. And I start to realize, oh, and like, you know, I could see that and, and it, it starts to change my opinion. And, um, and so we're all, um, we are, we're all acting and reacting based on what each other is doing, which is exactly what the bees do as well. They, they are not giving a single static opinion in isolation. They are, their decisions are changing in over time very quickly based on what everybody else is doing. And so they are, um, and that, and that is this feedback loop where they're working together to converge upon the answer that they can best agree upon. And, and there's really two big benefits of that feedback loop. One, it will give an answer that is a better representation of the knowledge and wisdom and insight of the group. Two, the people who participate will actually have more buy-in to the final answer. Right, they own it. Right, they, if, even, if it went, even if the answer went to something that was totally different than what they were initially pulling for or even ever pulled for, they, they still participated. They were still part of that complex process that, that um, allowed the, the group to converge on an answer and they will feel like their opinion mattered. And so um, it, it is, uh, it's about enabling everybody to have, you know, to be consequential. Whereas when you take a poll or a survey, you're almost making everybody feel like they, you know, unless they happen to give you the exact answers that came out as the final result, they very often feel like, yeah, you know, Nobody really cared what I had to say. That's like almost a deterrent to adopting whatever the, the decision is. I, I would like to ask you a few little scenarios just to um, get our listeners thinking about how they can apply this style of problem solving to their own challenges. And maybe we could just walk through what some potential outcomes could be. One of the biggest challenges that we have in our industry is fair regulation. I should say unfair regulation. That's the problem, the challenge. And when I say unfair regulation, uh, because vacation rentals are so new, relatively speaking, um, they are not exactly understood. There's a lot of bad actors. Of course, most of our community is extremely professional, trying to keep a, a very high standard. But on average, municipalities don't understand exactly what we do. It's too messy to control, uh, and they just throw the baby out with the bathwater. So uh, that would be an example of unfair regulation of making all short-term rentals in any given destination illegal, which happens. Um, so a lot of our short-term rental leaders are getting together and trying to form some kind of consensus from the local stakeholders, whether it's other fellow owners and managers, perhaps it's local business owners who are affected by vacation rental tourists. Maybe it's neighbors who can't stand the party house down the block. Uh, if you were to ha hold something of a swarm session with a group that diverse, they could theoretically produce an outcome that not even the smartest person in the room could, could try to, right? Oh, absolutely. So it's, um, the thing about a swarm is it is, you know, you get the, the most powerful results when you have a very diverse group. Why is that? Well, if everybody comes in with the exact same opinion, 
then that's going to be the answer and you didn't necessarily amplify their intelligence. Now, if you have a group of people who, uh, who each bring slightly different perspectives, have different backgrounds, uh, come from different disciplines, um, well, now you're, you're combining knowledge and wisdom and insight that is, um, that is coming from a lot of different places and all of that input is being, is being filtered through their different levels of conviction, right? And in the case of, of your particular problem, conviction uh, might be the most important thing because there's probably a, a whole list of complaints that stakeholders have f uh, about vacation rentals, but which are the ones that they really feel strongly about and which are the ones are just, you know, not mm -hmm. that important? Well, if you wanted to, if, if you brought together a swarm of people who are, you know, coming at it from all the different directions, um, from, you know, the local government to the neighbors to local law enforcement. I mean, you could, you could easily have people with all these different backgrounds coming together and you might wonder, well, what really is the most, what really is the problem that, that you need to solve that they feel the strongest mm -hmm. about and which are the ones that are really not significant. Mm -hmm. You could find that in a swarm uh, relatively quickly and it allows, um, it allows their group to really converge on their strength of their of their feeling. Meaning, if there are, if there are concerns that really people let go of very very quickly, you'll see that in the swarm. You'll see, oh yeah, you know, people, you know, they have, you know, they have this kind of knee jerk reaction that this particular thing is a problem, but really they don't they don't have much conviction that that's that's a problem. Mm -hmm. But this other thing. You know, that is, you know, that's their real concern. It is a really good application of of uh, of swarm, and uh, and we've seen, you know, we've seen it used in a, in a lot of different ways. We we did a project um, for the American Heart Association uh, where they wanted to know um, why certain people wouldn't take care of themselves uh, the way they should, and um, and what what they actually did was, and these were older people. They wanted to know well, how. You know, why are these older people not taking care of themselves? And so they actually asked their kids, like their adult kids, to, to form a swarm and to, to figure out those issues uh, in an objective way. And so it's, you know, there are really interesting things you can do with swarm when you think about, well, what is the population of people we want to pull together? And there could be really creative ideas there. It doesn't have to be the population that seems the most obvious, right? It could be, in, in your case, you could easily imagine doing swarms of the, the owners of vacation rentals, or you could easily imagine doing swarms of the neighbors to vacation yeah. rentals, or both. Or you could bring them both into the same into the same group and see what, what emerges. That's that's interesting. I mean, we, we have, you know, we do a lot of work for political groups. And so you can imagine if we bring together groups of Democrats and Republicans and ask questions, we see really interesting things happen because we know they're coming into it mm -hmm. with very different perspectives. Uh, you could imagine, you know, fielding groups in, in your space that, uh, again, are similar, where you have, you know, you know that there's going to be very strong adverse opinions coming into this um, because you're pu putting, you know, neighbors and owners together and, and you know going in what are the hot button questions to ask and you might very quickly start to realize, um, oh, we can find the places that they actually agree. Yes, I love that. Um, another example would be perhaps less, less controversial within a professional vacation rental management company. Uh, we like to focus a lot on gifts that are given to guests upon departure so that they remember their stay. Uh, and let's say a company wanted to do a really thoughtful gift for each guest upon departure, and they wanted to spend less than uh, 30 bucks. The CEO of that company may have one great idea, but if he gets uh, his reservation specialists, if he gets his uh, maintenance team, his housekeepers, uh, if he gets maybe even a former guest into his swarm or her swarm, the outcome of whatever that suggested gift is going to likely much more accurately reflect the right answer, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's, I mean, that's a great example of a, of a use case for swarm. Um, and you could bring together, um, I mean, you could bring together potential customers and your business stakeholders 
because let's say um, there there might be a set of gifts that customers would love, but they might have problems that other stakeholders wouldn't like. Either they're too expensive, or maybe they, um, you know, there could be some gifts that um, that spoil, and mm -hmm. uh, and spoilage like sp spoilage is just a logistical problem. The customers don't care; they're just happy, you know, if you gave them, you know, a gift basket of cherries or something. <laughs> like, I, I don't know, but but the the point is that. I like that. There are these competing constraints, right? There's, you know, logistical constraints. And, and and so you can bring all those people together and you can converge on what are the solutions that actually you know, satisfy all these different constraints. And uh, we've actually done projects in, in a similar space. We have a customer that's a very, very large credit card company. And, um, and they wanted to optimize uh, the cash back gifts, right? Um, you know, what, you know, what kind of cash back? Um, rewards do uh, do people gravitate to do, do, would, uh, that actually would have the most impact? And again, lots of interesting competing constraints, um, and you can converge upon you know, really good answers. Uh, one, one final little example that I'd like to just throw your way, uh, along with a question, would be because our industry is so new, there are no clearly defined standards necessarily. You don't know for a fact that if you stay in a vacation rental in uh, San Luis Obispo, that it's going to have the same amenities such as towels and shampoos as a property in Miami. So we could theoretically get professional owners and managers from across the country to agree on some kind of basic standards. And the question here would be, do swarms operate best when everybody has a high level goal together? It's the same intention or is that not necessary? This idea of coming to coming up with a set of standards is, a, is also a really good example. Um, you could imagine that you have, um, you know, a set of 20 possible standards uh, or, or you could collect a set of 50, like, Everyone might have different ideas of what the standard should be. Coming up with the ideas is probably the easy part. The hard part is then filtering that down into what are a set, what are the set of ideas that really make sense as a universal standard for everybody. And uh, and mm -hmm. so if you bring these people together, um, you could very easily prioritize the standards and see, you know, out of these fifty standards, you know, which are the set of twelve that bubble up to the top as the ones that that everybody can agree upon are universal and um and you could absolutely you could absolutely do that uh and we've seen lots of projects like that where um there's a large set of potential ideas and the hard part is then saying you know which are the ones that resonate the best with our with our diverse population, I, I think a lot of people listening are, are really get, starting to think about how uh, the group can be wiser, not necessarily smarter, but wiser than any single individual. The last topic that I just want to touch briefly on uh, has to do with virtual community and collaboration in this new era. Most groups in our industry do communicate. Uh, and collaborate to an extent. And when I say groups, they're almost always geographically um, specific. So let's say the Denver Short-Term Rental Alliance is a great example. They have Facebook groups, which we've discussed tend to be inflammatory and just not conducive to amplifying intelligence. They have newsletters, which are fantastic, but tend to be one directional in the way that the information flows. And they have their virtual or pre-COVID in-person meetups where most of the big decision-making and brainstorming takes place. Do you ever get the sense that these existing mediums, I'm guessing you've seen them across various sectors, um, have holes in them and that a better virtual platform to communicate on um, is an important thing? Because in our industry, if we don't have a, a more efficient way to collaborate we're never even going to get to the point of these kinds of conversations because we'll never be opened to these different ideas. What's your take on the role of virtual community in its best sense um, moving forward? Obviously, this idea of virtual communities is uh, 
is especially important right now with the pandemic, but I think it's um, certainly a, a notion that is here to stay. And especially, I mean, especially for groups that are distributed and, and people are um, all around the country all, or all around the world. And how do you, you know, how do you enable them to feel like a community? Um, you could, you know, all these different tools have their their place. Um, there are some tools that are, you know, just good for sharing messages, um, but very, very easily the those tools, um, like you said, your Facebook group become um, can easily become toxic because the people who are the most passionate at either posting or or voting. Um, might just have a grievance, <laughs> they, and so you're right. So you're just saying, oh, our industry has plenty of those, <laughs> right? So you're amplifying grievances, and that doesn't really reflect the views of the full group. And so it is, um, in some sense, it's self-selecting the negative stuff. Mm -hmm. um, or you could try to bring a group together in real time, where everybody's there, and so now you're not, you haven't self-selected just you know the people who have a grievance. But very often those are things like newsletters or uh, or um, even a, you know a live webinar. Um, mm -hmm. But that's a one to many, and the one to many again doesn't you know you feel like you're telling everybody that they're basically uh, an observer or right. you know they're the audience. Um, whereas and so what's you know what I think is missing and obviously it's what the thing I work on is this you know. Is the idea of being able to bring a group together, but not just to have it one to many, but have it be you know the many back to the one, or the many to the many, and and, and the many to one is actually interesting because very often it's useful to have a moderator. Uh, so you bring a group together, and um, you know somebody's going to be asking the questions, and and the moderator could be coming up with those questions in real time, but if the moderator is asking questions. Then you can then you can basically have this conversation that emerges in real time. So you you could bring together you know a hundred professionals in your space, and you could start asking questions about you know what do we do about you know regulations and and it could start off by saying you know well what's you know what is our biggest you know of all the different regulations which one is our biggest concern that we should talk about and so mm -hmm. you could ask a question and the group can converge on that and so now you have the many back to the one but that one is just the moderator and and he conf and, and the group converges on a, a and then now the the moderator can say okay well let's spend our time on that and now mm -hmm. start asking questions about that and so you have this um this experience where the the whole group, whether it's a hundred people or a thousand people who are all connected in real time, are guiding the discussion of the mm -hmm. that the group is having, and it's it's real time. And so, you know, each question is influencing the next next question, influencing the direction of the discussion, and um, and it will it won't feel like a you know a one to one to many podcast or one to many newsletter it'll feel like a you know an actual community that mm -hmm. is um they're not together in the same room but they are they're working together to guide the, the whole in, the whole experience and, and in in the emerging industry this seems especially valuable and in a space when really no one knows where we're all going uh, so having at least leaders in a virtual space, uh, an ultimate, it's the feedback loop of feedback loops, presenting all of the constituents with what a, a consensus looks like. I, I, I just get super excited about that. Um, and actually in discussions with David, we're hoping to, to do some of this swarm intelligence, specifically a swarm session uh, with VRMB communities. So I'm extremely excited about that. And Lewis, I just wanted to close by saying thank you so much. When I was originally turned on to your, uh, to the video that I stumbled, I don't know how I found it. I watched it like 20 times in one night <laughs> and I'm going to post it below the podcast so everybody can hear it. I've shared it with all of my swimming friends. They probably think I'm crazy by now, <laughs> um, but it has really just enlightened something that I always kind of thought, felt about the way that our best industry groups are already operating. You just put a finger on it and help give context 
uh, both historically and in, in nature, uh, and brought it into the future. So I just wanted to thank you for, for that wonderful uh, leadership and for your time today. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. This is uh, definitely a, uh, a, a really interesting uh, application of, of the technology and, and a good one because it is so, uh, it's so distributed around the whole country, around the whole world, and, and everybody has, you know, mm-hmm. it, it's, you know, it couldn't be a better model for a swarm of bees, right? <laughs> they're, they're, they're all over. They, they all have, you know, everybody has slightly different view of the world, and you could bring them together and make really interesting insights. Amen to that. Most importantly, Lewis, when you're traveling, do you ever stay in professional vacation rentals? Uh, I, I have, yes. Okay, fantastic. Well, on your next travels, please do reach out. We'd love to introduce you. Make sure that you get the towels and the soap. <laughs> and hopefully by that time, our swarm will have come to some kind of agreements as well. So thank you once again. Okay, thanks. I hope you enjoyed this discussion as much as I did having it. The episode was produced by Tammy Rowe and Stuart Hooper of Mango Fish Studios. Our intro song is The Moon of Pijang by Instant Party. And if you feel inspired, please consider sharing to social media with your big takeaway. We love takeaways. They make us feel great. Lastly, if you want to receive updates, you can do so at vrmb.com slash mmm. And if you want to join our virtual community of vacation rental professionals, become a member of BRMB's Inner Circle today. Until next time.